four, we're going to continue our, our study in temptation. We're, we're getting toward the, the trail end of this. And um, just uh, probably a, a few uh, a few more studies and we'll, we'll be through this. But I, I hope that it's been helping you. And um, it, there's been a lot to it. It's amazing how you really can dig into something like this. And it has literally taken us from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. We have seen stuff happen in the garden with Adam and Eve all the way to the very end in the book of Revelation. So it, it's been a study that has taken us on a journey uh, through the word of God. But I hope more than, more than anything, I hope that you've been able to win a few battles. I hope that you've been able to get some victory over some things. And, uh, and I hope you've been able to say, get behind me, Satan, a few times. Because, uh, listen, the, the devil's out to attack. He's out to destroy. He's out to kill. Uh, the Bible makes that clear and stuff. So we, uh, we've we been talking about knowing our enemy, what the enemy's saying, what the enemy's trying to do, what the enemy's strengths and weaknesses are. We're looking at the enemy. It's important to understand the enemy's position and what they're capable of so we can counteract that. So we can identify that. So we know that, hey, when we're out one day minding our own business, having a good day, and then all of a sudden something enters our mind, and it's like, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. We can immediately identify that and put it to rest, put it to bed, say, get behind me, Satan. I hope that you've been able to do that some through this study, and, uh, and this study has helped me. I hope it's helped you, and it's been a little bit of a different kind of study for our church, especially on Sunday mornings. Um, but there's so much going on in the world today, so many temptations on every corner and stuff that, that people are dealing with. And a lot of times if we adults can learn how to deal with temptation and overcome it and have victory, we can pass that on to our kids and our grandkids and teach others and stuff because, listen, uh, there, there is battles going on in, in all fronts today in our world and stuff. There's no doubt about it. And last week we kind of ended with the fall on uh, the influence that Satan has and, and how powerful he is. But we made the comment, and it was so important to understand that that even though he's got great influence, that doesn't mean or guarantee victory. Just because you have great influence does not guarantee victory. And we as Christians and stuff, we know what the final chapter says. We know how the whole thing is going to end. We've looked ahead and we've read Revelation. We've studied Revelation. And we know that one day God's going to say that's enough. That's it. And he's going to cast Satan, that, that, that old uh, serpent, that dragon into what? The lake of fire. And that's going to be the end of him and never have to worry about him again. Isn't that going to be wonderful? We're going to be in heaven uh, with, with Jesus one day and not have to worry about none of this mess. And, and I, I told you before, one thing that makes it so hard serving God day in and day out here in this world is because we are literally playing in the devil's backyard. And remember, he's the ruler of this world, right? He's the ruler of this world. The darkness and principalities, the powers, the air and all that stuff. We know that the Bible tells us that over in Ephesians and things. So we kind of led into the next point and stuff for this morning. And I'm going to uh, try to give you just a, a, probably three more after this and stuff this morning to get through this and kind of change the subject on it a little bit next time we get together to study this. But we started out by talking about last week, we ended with this, uh, one of his strengths and weaknesses is his fiery darts. Uh, well, you know, you've heard that, if you've been in church uh, much of your life at all, you've probably heard a lot of preachers and teachers and stuff talk about those fiery darts, the fiery darts of the, of the devil and stuff. I've heard that saying my entire life. And, and we know that those are attacks coming at you and stuff like that. And, and we a lot of times when we read that word dart, it's so important to understand over in Ephesians, if you're taking notes, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16 talks about this, talks about the fiery darts of the devil. And we talked about how a lot of times in our English language, we hear the word dart, we think of that little thing like this that you play, you know, darts and throw on the wall, and it's got little feathered edges to it, the sharp end, and you just throw those, right? And that's what we think of. But if you if you look in the in the Greek, the way that it was the, the way that it was written, it means belos, B-E-L-O-S, and it literally means missile. It's actually where we get our word missile from. It means a missile, just like in the military. A missile. So when you take a little tiny dart, 
and you say, well, that don't really mean that anymore. That means a missile. Then that kind of puts a whole new perspective on this thing. That changes your outlook on, wow, those attacks are a lot more powerful than I thought. It's not just these little pricks and, and, and things of, of, of a little tiny dart hitting you and stuff. It's a it's a assault. It's in a, in a missile attack from Satan himself. It kind of gives you a new perspective of how, how that looks and how that shapes up. But when those fiery darts come our way, what's the Bible tell us to do? It tells us to raise our shield of faith. We know as Christians and stuff, we should know as Christians, that one thing the Bible tells us, that it's absolutely impossible to please God without one thing. And that one thing is faith. You cannot please God, no matter what you do in life, you cannot please God if you don't have faith. The Bible makes it clear and tells us it's impossible to please Him without faith. We have to have faith. We have to have faith in Jesus Christ. We have to have faith that He was born of a Virgin Mary and He lived a perfect life. We have to have faith that He died on Calvary. We have to have faith that He rose again. We have to have faith that He has saved our soul. It's faith that pleases God. That's why the Bible, I mean, it made, if Jesus, he said in himself, he said, just have faith the grain of the size of a mustard seed. He said, you move mountains. I'm paraphrasing that, of course, but literally that's what he was saying. And when you look at a mustard seed, you see how little a mustard seed is. I actually got a bottle sitting on my desk at home. I've had it there for a few years, and I often just look at it a lot of times when I study to see how little those mustard seeds are and everything, and, and, and it measures our faith. Kind of gives us a measuring stick uh, to go by, but uh, but we when we believe God and take Him at His word, guess what? The lies of the enemy are are, are snuffed out. They're flamed out. Those darts, those fiery darts, those missiles and stuff, they can they can flame out. If we trust God, if we have faith in God, and we take Him for what His word says, and He says He'll take care of us, that He'll protect us, He'll be there for us. He'll be closer than a brother. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. If we can put our faith in all of that and trust that truly, guess what? Those, those missiles, those darts coming our way won't have the effect they had before. I hope that makes sense to you. And, you know, um, a lot of times and stuff, those, those missiles, those fiery darts that he's firing at us, sometimes they can be launched one at a time. Sometimes they can be launched one right after the other. Sometimes they might be launched a bunch all together at one time. It can happen different ways and different things, but it's a targeted attack. Listen to me. When Satan comes after you and he launches those missiles, whether it's one at a time or one right after the other or a hundred coming from a different direction, when he does that, it is a targeted attack on you and me. It's a targeted attack on our mind and our heart. On our mind and our heart. And guess what? Every time, you know, a lot of our military now, they have laser-guided missiles. You know, they can fire a missile and it locks onto a point and he knows right where it's going. It will go to that point. Guess what? Satan missiles do that too. And that point is called weakness. He knows where your weakness is. And guess what? He's got a laser-guided missile pointed right at you, and he knows where to strike you where you're weakest. He knows your weakness. He knows whether it can take one missile, two missiles, or 50 missiles, darts, whatever you want to call it. But he knows how to attack you. I never will forget it. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, there years ago and stuff when we went into uh, Iraq and stuff, when the United States was going in and after they had went into Afghanistan, they was going into Iraq next. I never will forget it. I kept hearing them say that they was going to do something called shock and awe. Some of you probably remember that. And I remember I stayed up to watch that and stuff. And, and they had cameras set up. And all of a sudden, you just saw a barrage of missiles coming from different directions and just explosion after explosion after explosion. And, I mean, they just hit them with everything. <coughs> they them. Guess what Satan's doing? He's trying to give us a shock and awe. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to hit you so much at one time sometimes that it freezes us, that it locks us up, that it destroys us. Remember what the what his goal is? We talked about it in the past two weeks. His goal is to what? Imprison you 
and to disable you. Right? How's one way he can do that? He can fire those darts in the right place at the right time, and he can instantly disable you. What does a missile do? A missile disables something. It blows something up. It destroys something. What is Satan's ultimate goal for us? To destroy us and destroy, destroy our testimony. Remember, Satan, if you're saved today, Satan knows he has lost you to heaven. He knows that. So he's going to try to destroy your testimony and, and, and wear you down and, and get you down so much that you're just a, 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 a Christian that don't do anything for the kingdom of God. No praying, no reading, no testifying, no, no witnessing, no, no nothing. Satan knows he lost you, but he don't want you to take anybody with you. We talked about that. So we see the fiery darts come. And I, and I believe, you know, as, as I've said before, there's no doubt a spiritual battle happening around us at all times. It never stops. It never sleeps. It never ends. It's been that way since the beginning, okay? And, and we can't see into that with our physical eyes. But there are literally and stuff fighting going on around us at all times. I mean, I, I believe that, that, that it is warfare happening around us, spiritual warfare. And, and we're seeing that pretty much out in the open in today's society now. I mean, we are. I mean, the, the evil people and different things and stuff in the world, they don't try to hide stuff anymore. Have you noticed that? Yes. They, they try to keep stuff under wraps years ago. Now everything's out in the open. I mean, Satan, you know, he used to kind of keep stuff hid a little bit or, or keep it under wraps some, but not anymore. It's out in the open. He's like, here it is. Here it is. And what's a lot of it targeted at? A lot of it is targeted at our children. Why? Because he knows if he can get that, hey, he's got the next generation. And that's what he ultimately wants is an entire generation to forget God, to turn their backs on God. And we've talked about that in here before. We know how simple and easy that can happen. It can happen very, very easily. One generation can be on fire for God. The very next generation can know nothing about God. It can, it's happened in the Bible. It's happened in the Bible. It's happened throughout history of time in different eras, different time periods. It can easily happen again. Listen, the next time... Those fiery darts come your way. The missiles come your way. What should we do? We should raise that shield of faith. Mm -hmm. Raise that shield of faith. That defense mechanism that's going to keep you protected from those darts. You know, if you look back at that at old ancient warfare and stuff like that, and, and, and even during this time in the Romans and all that, they had their bows and arrows, and they'd launch those arrows. And it, a lot of times they'd, they'd arc it and, and launch it down on their enemy. And it would rain arrows down on the, on the enemy below. Well, what would they do? They would take those shields and hold it up above them, wouldn't they? And it would protect, what, their whole body. Listen, God has given us a shield. He's given us a shield of faith. As I said before, it's impossible to please God without faith. The Bible makes that clear. It tells you and I that. It's impossible to please him without it. So we've got to have it. We've got to have faith. We've got to have it. Another thing is know your enemy's strengths and weaknesses. We need to know another strength and weakness of Satan. And what is that? It's his, it's his lies. It's his lies. Look in our text in chapter 4, verse number 7 of Luke. Look at this. In verse number 7 of Luke, chapter 4 there, it says, If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. He says, all shall be thine. He said, all this is going to be yours if you just get down and worship me. You know, a lot of people in the world today and stuff, Satan's promising them a lot of things. He's writing a lot of checks that he can't cash, and he knows that. He knows he's limited. He knows that he can't do everything. But he will make it look nice to a lot of people and tell them a lie to believe that, hey, this will be mine if I do this. You can fill in the blank with a lot of different situations and scenarios there and say, you know what, if I do this, then that could be mine. This could be all mine. You know? And, and you know, the Bible makes it clear. It tells us and stuff, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Boy, think about that for a minute. If, if the world could get a hold of that today. There's so many people that are after the whole world. They're after power. They're after prestige. They're after the money. They're after the fame. They're after the fortune. They're after all this stuff. But the Bible says those people 
What does it profit to them? They're going to lose their soul. Listen, do you realize the most valuable thing that you have and possess today is your soul? Yes. The most valuable thing that you have or will ever have in this lifetime is not a house, not a car, not anything like that. It is your soul. Why? Because Jesus died for it. Jesus died on Calvary for your soul and for my soul. It is the most valuable thing. Our soul is valuable. It is valuable. We got, we got to know his lies. He told Jesus that there uh, in verse number 7 a, a lie. And guess what? If you tell a lie long enough, what happens? You start to believe it. That's exactly right. If you start telling a lie long enough, you start to believe it. You start to believe it. And you believe it's true. You believe without a shadow of a doubt it is it is true. You have told you have you have you have deceived yourself at that point. You you have. And guess what? Somewhere in Satan's delusional mind, he thought Jesus would bow before him. He did. And I mean, this is crazy to think, but think about that for a minute. Satan literally thought in his mind that God. Jesus, right here, God and man, right here in front of him, Jesus Christ was going to bow down and worship him. He thought that. Listen, if you tell yourself a lie long enough, you're going to believe it. And the world's filled with lies today. It is filled with it. It's like, well, what's truth anymore? You know, I love that question Pilate asked Jesus. He said, what is truth? I love that. There's a lot you could go off of that. But we know that God is truth. We know he is truth. We know his word is truth. We know that. But he believed that Jesus would bow before him. He, he believed that. John, you don't have to flip here, uh, but um, if you're taking notes, you might want to pin this down and go look at it. But John chapter number 8, verse number 44, John 8, 44 says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. What a powerful verse. If you notice in your Bible, that's written in red. Jesus said that. Jesus said that about the old devil. Notice what he said. He said he was a murderer from the beginning. It says that he was that uh, that there is no truth in him. He speaketh a lie. He speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Guess what? If there is lies happening out there, who's behind it all? The devil. Satan. He he loves lies. He loves lying to people. He loves bending the truth, sh shaping it how he wants it to be. Remember, that's where we get the word pervert from. It's twisted. He perverted the God's word. He twisted God's word in the garden with Adam and Eve. Guess what he's still doing today to people? He's twisting God's word and saying, oh, God is love. He's going to love you no matter what lifestyle you live. That's a lie from hell. I'm here to tell you that right now. That's a lie from hell. There are standards that God set forth in his word that we should live by. Amen. And we choose whether to live by those or not. If you do, great. If you don't, you're a sinner. You're sinning. You're, you're out of God's will. <coughs> that's not me. That's not my opinion. That's God's word. And guess what? Satan has a lot of people believing lies today. He has a lot of people believing lies today. Like I said, if you tell a lie long enough, you start to think it's true. You start believing it. You're safe. <laughs> Satan, he constantly uses lies to fuel fire. He will constantly tell lies to either make people believe what they want or to tear people down. One or the other. He uses Basically, John 8, 44 that I just read there, he uses that to effectively to overcome sound thinking by offering something plausible. He, he, he tries to alter our sound thinking. 
listen, we're sitting here today, and, and I hope that you know what, what truth is and what God's Word says about things. But guess what? The, the devil's going to come along, and, and, and he'll whisper in that ear, and he'll lie to you, and he'll tell you stuff. He'll be like, guess what? You can go to bed with that person. No one ever knows. It'd just be between the two of you. You can go to bed with her. You can go to bed with him. Nobody would need to know. You can go out and have a drink. It's just you. It's just one. Nobody ever knows. You can take that pill. Knock off the edge. It'll be okay. It's just one time. You can watch this. You can listen to that. It's just one time. Is that not true? Yes, sir. Satan is speaking that ear. And next thing you know, a lot of times when you hear that reasonable voice in your head, it don't sound spooky and creepy like it ought to. It sounds like you and it sounds like me. It sounds like our voice trying to talk ourselves into something that, hey, you know what? This will be okay. This will be okay. It ain't going to affect nobody or nothing if I do this one time. It ain't going to affect nobody if I just, you know, take a sip. It ain't going to affect nobody if I if I tell this one little lie. Listen, guess what? The Bible makes it clear your sins will find you out. Yes, sir. Yeah. The Bible tells us that. And don't ever think that your choice and what you're trying to keep a secret of won't affect other people around you. Because it can. It will. Yes, sir. Say, well, how is that possible? Well, perfect example of that in me. They disobeyed God, and what they do? They sent the whole world into sin. It affected generations even until this day, over 6,000 years later. It can affect people around you. <laughs> Listen, the Satan is the father of lies. God, everything about God is truth. Everything about him is truth. Whether you like it or not, whether it lines up with what you believe or not, God is truth. And if you read the Bible and you don't like a certain part or a certain section, that's your problem, not God's. That, that's you. That's a you problem because God is truth. It's up to us to line up with this, not this to line up with this. Does that make sense? Guess what Satan is trying to do to, to the world today, to the churches today, to society today? He's trying to tell people, hey, guess what? This... Needs to line up with you, not vice versa. Listen, we need to line up with what God's word says about things, whether you like it or not. Because guess what? God is truth. It's eternal ramifications. It's eternal. But we got so many people believing the lies of Satan today. And they're like, well, that don't affect nobody. This is just me. Listen, what does it profit as a man to gain the whole world to lose your soul? What does it, what does it cost you? Listen, the, the best way we can fight these attacks off, these lies of Satan when he comes knocking, when he comes telling you about things, the best way you can fight that off is do exactly what Jesus did to Satan and say, it is written. The Bible is not a matter of opinion. It's not a book that you can pick and choose from. It's either all or nothing. It's all or nothing. Listen, a lot of people, I've heard it even with my own ears, people say, but God understands. And I'm just being honest with you, this morning I get sick and tired of hearing that lie from Satan. You know why? Because God is holy and he is righteous. And the only thing God understands is he's perfect, and we ought to be. He's sinless, and we should be. He gave us his word to live by. It's our choice to live by, and we should be. He's basically saying, I gave you an instruction booklet that is absolutely perfect in every way, that you will be able to live forever and ever and ever, and be in heaven with me forever and ever and ever, and it's our choice to use that that's been given to us or not. But a lot of times, what do we do? We choose the opposite. Why? Because we live in a sinful flesh. We like doing what feels good to us. We like doing what helps us. But do you realize that being a Christian, being saved, 
It means you're a servant. You're serving God. You're serving somebody. And I think it was Jude put it this way. He said, I'm a bond servant. I'm basically a slave. Not the kind of slave that that uh, people want to paint out today and stuff in history and everything. But we are to serve God. But one of the things that we need to identify is Satan's lies. He's the father of lies. Counteract that by saying it is written. Saying it is written. Because notice this. We read verse number 7. He says, if, there, if you'll do this, if you worship me, all shall be thine. He's saying, Jesus, if you get down and worship me, you can have it all. All these kingdoms of the world. We talked about that a little bit last week. But look at verse number 8. It says, and Jesus answered and said unto him, I love this, get thee behind me, Satan, for what? It is written that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Who should we only serve today? God. We should only have one God in our life, shouldn't we? There's a reason, you know, the Ten Commandments, they were given in, in perfect order by God. There's a reason he put the first one as thou shalt have no other gods before me. Because guess what? If you start putting other gods before him at number one there, all those other nine things are very possible and likely to happen. Maybe not all nine of them, but four of them, four of them maybe, three of them, two of them, one of them. It don't matter. You put another God in front of God, it's easy to fall for those other traps. It's so important to keep him first and foremost. You've got to do that. We have to do that, church. He says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Who are you serving today, church? Are you serving God? Or are you serving yourself? Are you serving God? <laughs> Or are you serving what feels good to you? Are you serving him? Or are you listening to the lies of the devil saying, if I don't tell anyone, if I keep it a secret, no one will ever know, it'll all be okay. Listen, you realize how many people is in hell today because they kept something a secret thinking they were okay? A lot. Another thing we need to know about our enemy's strength and weakness, we're almost done this morning. Hang with me just a few more minutes. Know your enemy's strengths and weaknesses. One thing we need to understand about Satan is his pride. We need to understand his pride. Satan has power, yes, we've talked about that, but he also has weakness. He also has weakness. Number one weakness for him is his overdeveloped ego. His overdeveloped ego. To Jesus... God Almighty in human form, he said, therefore, if you worship me, he said, if you worship me, it's hard to believe that a created being, which is what Satan is, he was created by God, a created being could be so twisted, so evil, so caught up within himself that he would attempt to put God the Son against God the Father. But guess what? It happened. He did that. He tried it. He attempted that. He tried to put God the Son against God the Father. Boy, he, he's, he's, uh, he's pretty uh, uh, prideful in what he thinks he's able to accomplish, isn't he? Listen, one of his weaknesses is his pride. Is his pride. I've talked about it before. We see so much stuff with pride in today's society and stuff. And it's, ta I mean, it's taking people to hell. I mean, there's a reason it's called pride, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying on all that. The devil loves it. He loves it. He's all about pride. Satan is the embodiment. He's the picture-perfect thing, I guess you could say, of pride and ego. He is. Throughout the Word of God and stuff, those attacks that he did, and even to this very day when he attacks you and he attacks me, guess what? He goes with the expectation that he's going to win. He attacks you with the expectation, I'm going to win. I'm going to overcome that person. I'm going to lead them down this path. I'm going to do that. If he didn't have that confidence about himself, he wouldn't attack you with me. But he does. He goes into every attack thinking he's got us, thinking he's going to win. What should we do? 
We should knock him off his high horse from time to time, shouldn't we? And say, guess what? It is written. Say, it is written. Listen, if you're taking notes, take down these chapters and stuff. Go back and read them sometime. We're not going to read them today for sake of time because they're kind of long there and everything, but full of information. You can spend a long time on it. But if you, if you go back and read Isaiah chapter number 14 and Ezekiel chapter number 28, both describe Satan's true nature. Both of those chapters, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, they describe the true nature of Satan. And you can learn a lot about him reading those two chapters. Okay, so if you're taking notes, you can mark that down. But guess what? His name was Lucifer. We know that his name was Lucifer, son of the morning. Perfect since the day he was created. I'm paraphrasing those two chapters here, basically. He was full of wisdom. His hands were like tambourines. His sides were like pipes. He was a living, breathing music machine. He led the angels in heaven in worship. He is basically the choir leader in, in heaven. He led the angels in worship to God until the day he was cast out of heaven because of one thing. And it's called pride. He was cast out of heaven because of his pride. Isaiah 14 15 and 16 talks about that. Chapter 14, verses 15 and 16 outline that. Pride may be Satan's greatest weakness, but he understands its power. He understands its power. That's why he loves to use it against us as humans. Because I guarantee you, there's nobody in here, none of us in here, that don't love a pat on the back every once in a while. Am I right? Everybody in here loves a pat on the back every once in a while. You're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. You're doing a good job. Here's a bonus for all your hard work. You're doing a, doing a good job. Way to go. Getting a, you know, being called out for something good. Doing something, something nice, something good, whatever the case may be. There none of us in here don't like that. But you have to be careful with stuff like that. You ever seen somebody get a promotion at work and all of a sudden next day, boom, they're a different person? Go straight to their head? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it happens. It had, oh, I got the power now. I got the power. I'm not on the same same level as you anymore. I'm, I'm one up now. It don't take much to cause that ego, to cause that pride to show in a human being. It don't, it don't, it don't take much at all. Pride is dangerous. Why is pride so dangerous? Because it's natural. It's natural to us as humans. That's what makes it so dangerous. I'm not talking about the person that is arrogant and boastful and loud. Those are easy to spot. You can, you can point those a mile away. You know, the people that are loud and it's all about them and the spotlight's on them and they're boastful, they're proud. All that stuff, that's, they're arrogant about things. Those are easy to spot. Those are easy. And I'm thinking of people that have just very subtle attitudes that creep in and are equally as ugly. Little things that, that creep in, little thoughts, little actions, little things. It can be just as bad. Does that make sense? It's kind of like early on when I said, you know, Satan's voice. You know, it's not creepy. It's not scary. Because why? That would be easy to spot. That would be easy to identify. No, the voice is more like what? It's our voice. It's reasonable. It's us talking to ourselves type thing. Right? So it's kind of that same uh, same uh, idea, I guess you could say. But listen, the, the good news is, for us as Christians and stuff, the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us will show us our personal areas of prideful things. It will show us our areas of of, hey, where we need to maybe humble ourselves. Where we need to sit back and say, you know what, I need to chill out in that area of my life. The Holy Spirit will show you things. Now, if you're not saved, guess what? You don't have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. You don't have the Holy Spirit showing you these things. If you're not saved, you belong to Satan right now. Uh, and I'm not saying that to be mean or scary or anything like that. I, I, I want to tell you the truth. You belong to somebody. You either belong to God or you belong to Satan. If you're saved, you belong to God. If you're not saved, you belong to Satan. It's one or the other. Say, well, I don't want to be belong. I don't want to, uh, Satan to, uh, uh, to own me anymore. I don't want to belong to Satan anymore. Well, good. 
be saved. Ask Jesus to save you. Repent of your sin. Guess what? Jesus to save you. Then guess what? You're a child of the king then. That ownership transfers from Satan to God like that. Aren't you thankful for that? Listen, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14, based, Satan basically had a fantasy there of I will be like God. He said, I will be like God. I will be equal to God. Let me tell you something right now. God has no equal. God has no equal. I don't care who the most powerful person is on planet earth today or will ever be. There will be Satan himself, whoever. There will never be an equal to God Almighty. Why? Because he didn't share that with anybody. We know that he knows all things at one time. He's everywhere at one time. He's all knowing. We know all that stuff about God. He did not share that with anybody else. Aren't you thankful for that? Listen, we've talked a long time for three weeks now, I guess, about knowing our enemy. Knowing his strengths and his weaknesses and his plans and his voice and all those different things. I want to end with this this morning. We as Christians and stuff, you know what we need to do? We need to make Satan tremble. We need to make him tremble. Say, well, how can you do that? I'm glad you asked. Go over to the book of James. James chapter number 2. This will be the last time we flip this morning. But James chapter number 2, if you would, please. Listen, our adversary is the devil. And our adversary is afraid. Satan and his demons, they tremble thinking about God, hearing about God. Notice in James chapter number 2, we're done this morning. This will be the last thing we talk about. James chapter number 2. Verse number 19. If you don't if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, if you mark in your Bible, highlight, underline. If you're one of those that do that, this is a good verse to mark. James chapter number 2, verse number 19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Notice what the Bible says about the devils right there. It's talking about Satan. It's talking about the demons of hell and stuff. Guess what? They tremble hearing about God. Knowing what we believe and stuff, that we believe, hey, there is a God. And it says, guess what? The devils believe that too. And they tremble. The interesting word, the Greek word there, if you look at the word tremble, the Greek word is, is uh, hero soul. And it actually means goose skin. And if you've ever plucked feathers on a goose or a turkey or a chicken or whatever, you see all those little bumps. You've heard of goose bumps. I got chill bumps. I got goose bumps. All that stuff, right? That's actually what that word means. So literally, the devils of hell get goose bumps when they hear about God. That's actually what that means. So if you've seen those goose bumps, you can imagine what's happening in the, in the demonic realm when a believer, when a Christian speaks about God, guess what? They hate it. They hate it. They hate it when you tell others about Jesus Christ. They hate it when you speak the name Jesus. They hate it when you talk about God. They hate that. Demons literally shiver with goosebumps every time a person cries out for salvation of souls. Think about that for a minute. They, they get goosebumps. They tremble. But guess what? If you keep silent, if you never speak the name of Jesus, if you never speak the name of God, if you never witness to somebody else, if you never pray, if you never tell anybody about God, guess what? You give them no reason to be afraid. You give the demons of hell no reason to tremble. Because guess what? God's name is never coming from your mouth. If you remember, remember the maniac and stuff is running around the cemeteries and everything, and, and 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 Jesus showed up on the scene. Remember the the demons? He said, he said, were many and all that stuff, legion, and all that. And her name's legion, and, 
what they do, they, they, they beg God for mercy. They tremble at Jesus right there before his very feet. Listen, they tremble at the name of Jesus. Give them something to tremble about. Give them something to shiver about. Give them something to be afraid about. Listen, if we don't ever say that, we give no reason of fear. Because guess what? You've been neutralized. If Satan is able to imprison you and disable you like we talked about, and he gets you down and out, and you're never speaking the name of Jesus, you're never telling anybody about God, if you're never saying anything other than what you say in here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, whatever it is may be, guess what? You, as a Christian, you have been neutralized. And if you're neutralized, you're no threat whatsoever. You're no threat whatsoever. Speak the name of Jesus and make the demon tremble. Give them goosebumps. That's what James 2.19 tells us. It literally gives them goosebumps. That's where the Greek word comes from. It makes them tremble. They're afraid. Because they know who has the most power. They know what can happen or what will happen one day when Jesus says, that's it. It's over. It's done. And all that mess gets thrown into the lake of fire. They know. Make them tremble, church. We've talked a lot about the enemy and learning about the enemy and, and, and things he's going to say, things he's going to do. And, and I hope that that's helped you through this. Here in a, here in a few weeks when we pick this back up and stuff, because uh, uh, we're going we're to talk about knowing your position. When temptation comes, you need to know your position. Know where you stand. How are you going to stand? we got to know our position, church. But before we got to that point, we had to know a little bit more about the enemy. We had to learn more about the enemy. Why? So we could counteract that. So we could know the tricks of the devil. And I've seen a lot of you and stuff as we've talked about this. It's like a light bulb going off. I've seen some of your eyes and stuff be like, well, that's happened to me. Or, or I know what you're talking about. I can relate to that. Listen, I'm, a, uh, I'm an open book. I'm just like you are. I, I don't hide things. I don't think, hey, just because I'm a preacher, I'm on a pedestal up above you. I'm not. I'm human like you are. And I go through temptation like you go through temptation. Listen, I'm not above anything. Okay? And we're all in this fight together. And we all got to know how to fight and use our weapons accordingly. And listen, church, we need to pick up that shield of faith, block off those fiery darts of the devil, and guess what? Speak Jesus' name and give them goosebumps. Make them tremble, church. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody's looking around. Listen, I know Mary's not here this morning to play music, and that's okay.